it's all right. <laughs> um, hi everyone, welcome to week three uh, lecture for uh, English A. Um, Fleur and I have decided to do this lecture together. So this week we are uh, talking about um, multimodality. That's the, the key concept and idea for the week. Not that um, other ideas are being displaced, but uh, as we build up a set of concepts uh, to help us all think about English teaching and uh, learning in schools, um, this is clearly a key one. So um, in terms of where we're trying to uh, go today and the sorts of things we want to cover, um, we'll spend uh, a little bit of time talking about what multimodality is and why we should indeed care about it, um, what it has to offer us and um, why it's worth thinking about, those sorts of questions. We'll then make a link towards or from broader concepts of multimodality to practices within English classrooms. And then we'll try and sum up and talk about what we think um, it all might mean in terms of uh, our work as English teachers. So um, let's keep moving then. So in terms of uh, this idea of multimodality, we might begin um, with uh, what it is and, uh, and how we might um, sort of understand it. So at one uh, point, uh, at one level, I, I should say, um, the adjective multimodal is a way of describing any text or composition that uses more than one mode. Um, now, that might seem reasonably self-evident, but as soon as we ask ourselves a question about what a mode is, um, then things might get a little bit more uh, complicated. But modes are not so simple and straightforward. Here's a list of some modes. Um, language, of course, uh, image, uh, sound or audio, gesture, space and layout. These are reasonably common modes um, and there are a range of ways in which we might understand how these modes operate, but, but at a, a reasonably basic level, multimodal communication is the idea that um, these modes often operate in uh, collections or in various sorts of combinations. It's very un common to find a mode that operates by itself and so in fact almost all communication is uh, some form of multimodal communication. Um, if you imagine for example um, the lecture situation that we're experiencing right now is clearly a, a example of a multimodal communication. We have uh, language in the, in the form of writing uh, on the screen um, but of course the screen is also communicating in other ways um, in a very real way it's not just the form of writing it's also an image with color with um, some sort of design um, font suggests particular kinds of um, meanings uh, the colors do the arrangement of course many of us are very familiar with powerpoint it has its own sort of built-in ways of um, uh, arranging um, information. Um, of course, in sort of dot points, it sort of compels users to use that sort of way of um, presenting. Um, in addition to that, we've got some videos up in the corner, Fleur and I, and of course, we've got um, speech coming through as audio. Um, so that's just, you know, an example of the way in which this form of communication is, of course, multimodal. You might think of any form of communication you've engaged in uh, just uh, today, uh, whatever you've been doing, uh, and to consider the kinds of modes that have been combined or connected in various sorts of arrangements. Uh, I don't know whether you've got an example in your mind flow from your morning, but uh, is anything anything that comes to mind? Sorry to put you on the spot, Lauren. No, no, it's actually it's actually interesting to think about. So, for example, this morning over my morning coffee, I um, saw some Twitter notifications on my phone. And so I clicked on the icon for Twitter, had a look at what the notifications were. And someone I follow, a friend I follow on Twitter, had shared another person's tweet that had some images of Jacinda Ardern. And um, there was a thread there about Jacinda Arden with an image. And interestingly, some people were commenting on the image. They were analysing the image as well as talking about Jacinda Arden. Um, so that was clearly a multimodal text. 
yeah so it's not very difficult to um in a way to begin to understand this idea um if we start from a position that that really um we can think of any form of communication as as a situation where there are a range of what you might call multimodal or semiotic resources that are being employed to um, shape a, a particular kind of situation as a communicative or meaning making situation and that from, can be from very simple um, forms of communication or an individual walking through um, the world um, to various sorts of very highly um, textured, very uh, detailed, complex forms of communication um, and everything in between. Um, a couple of things worth um, noting here. As I said before, uh, um, well, Gunter Kress, uh, who's uh, one a theorist in this space, who unfortunately passed away, um, it might have been last year. Yeah, um, last year. Very well known um, theorist in communication, semiotics, and multimodality wrote and, and argued, if you like, that, um, that all of these um, modes are historical or that they have developed over time to realise particular kinds of meanings in particular ways. And that modes have, if you like, a hierarchy of um, importance in different societies and that those hierarchies of importance have been realised through time. It's um, uh, not difficult to see the way in which some modes uh, at the moment in our contemporary society are favoured or are used for particular kinds of purposes to make particular kinds of meanings. Um, it's often been remarked that we live in a, in a sort of image saturated uh, contemporary moment. Um, the uh, spectacle society, if you like, or um, uh, you know, it doesn't take uh, much to think about the way in which images come at us very quickly. And um, of course, 20, 30, 40 years ago, um, that might have been quite different. So different historical periods um, are associated typically with different sorts of modal combinations. Um, the other um, point to make here is that uh, language in particular, a uh, writing, um, in the contemporary times is often given a very high status in some forms of communication in some um, areas of uh, life and of uh, practice and knowledge. So within the universities, within workplaces, within uh, our political and government systems, the written word has uh, a different kind of power. Um, and, uh, and you might argue that it has uh, some sort of preeminence particularly in authorised forms of communication. Um, so I've noticed this week, of course, we have uh, our Premier Dan Andrews here in Victoria, um, who will regularly um, hold press conferences for the media, but he will also rely on um, written and published statements that provide uh, clarity or the official word on, uh, on what's happening in the, in the state. So there again, we've got an example of a combination of modes, but also this idea that uh, modes, um, different modes, uh, they play different roles in, in different historical periods. Um, there's a number of other points we might make about um, modes. Um, one brief one um, that's worth uh, thinking about is that when we uh, take a mode, um, it can be realized in different ways depending on the medium. Uh, in which it's expressed. Language is a, a good example of that. If language is a mode, um, that can be realised in uh, different ways. So um, one medium, if you like, for language is speech. Now we make speech with our vocal cords uh, generally and with uh, air that rushes out of those. Um, that medium, uh, the body and air, uh, produces a different kind of or is a different medium for language. Um, if we um, think about writing, of course, that uh, is using a different um, set of media or a medium to express the, the language mode. Um, 
And we, we've briefly touched on the notion of affordance already, and this is really the idea that, that different modes have different sorts of meaning potentials. And so language, image, sound, audio, and gesture, for example, um, tend to be, um, or tend to express modes in different ways and have developed particular capacities for realizing different meanings differently. Um, so we'll pick up this uh, issue with a couple of examples later on. So is there anything you want to add uh, here about sort of this idea of generally what, what we're talking about when we mentioned multimodality? Uh, no, except that you can link the affordance idea. Um, like that's been a really good introduction, thanks Scott. But also affordance, we've talked a bit about in relation to lesson design in the first couple of weeks. So we've been asking people to think about how different forms of lesson, like the way you design your lesson would be for different kinds of learning to occur. And so that idea of affordance and design is very useful for thinking about what you're doing and also then what kinds of text you're selecting, what kinds of engagements with meaning making you want your students to experience. And so yeah, different, different media also have different affordances for different kinds of meaning making. Yeah, so absolutely. this idea is really quite useful for a number of different asset, as, aspects of this unit. Yep, uh, uh, absolutely. Okay, well, let's, um, we'll keep moving. Um, so um, just to take a couple of examples, we're, we're going to look at some images um, and uh, some settings, some context, which we hope will allow us to tease out some of the ways in which multimodality might be understood uh, as a useful concept. So as we look at some of these examples, we invite you to ask these questions for yourself. Um, so in particular, uh, how does literacy or uh, more broadly, if you like, or meaning making work in the following contexts? What modes are being employed? Um, how are those modes shaping the, the kinds of meanings that might be made? The first example is um, a stop sign. I might, I might in fact ask Fleur if she's got any thoughts about this one straight up in terms of the, the kinds of ways in which a, a, a sign like this might or invite us to make particular kinds of meanings. Certainly culturally the colour red tends to indicate right. some kind of alert um, or attention seeking. So in terms of semiotic resources, people who make signage using the meanings of colours and we we know that also as we learn how to drive and get our driver's license we learn about different colours on signs actually having different meanings yeah, that's um, right. and we that's explicitly part of what you your curriculum if you like for becoming a licensed driver um, the the simplicity of the message also suggests an urgency there's no kind of extraneous information it's just one word and so it's about part of that attention gaining strategy. And there might be something to be said about the shape of the sign, it's sort of a in the grammar of signage, if you like, that um, it's an unusual shape. So it's part of using a range of resources to convey urgency and um, the need to be alert to its message. And I know when um, we travel overseas and we see other signage, often some of that signage is quite obscure to us we're not quite sure, not only because the language might be different, but because the conventions of signage in that country are different. And some of them might be the same. Red's pretty, pretty common as an alert symbol, but some of the signage might be quite obscure if, if, we're not, if we haven't actually learnt the, the, the conventions of signage in that country. So it's, it's a good example of how medium are also culturally situated. Yeah, that's right. Um, that, that's a, a really key point that um, we might assume, for example, because we're familiar with a particular set of conventions or um, semiotic resources, uh, or in this case, uh, the colour red, um, that that's somehow universal. Um, but of course, it's uh, worth reminding ourselves that um, signs like this uh, and various kinds of modes that we've become perhaps familiar or attuned to are not universal. They're in fact learned and they 
do not always cross cultures. But of course, cultural conventions operate in all sorts of cultures and, and you know, a family can be a culture, a, a local community, um, a university class, a church group, um, whatever the case would be, a workplace, all have codes and conventions that are, um, if you like, derived from shared practices. And uh, then those, of course, become sometimes naturalised or uh, neutral to us. Um, but thinking about multimodality in this way can attune us to the way in which um, meaning making is, in fact, um, never neutral. And it is always shaped and mediated by our interaction with particular kinds of uh, modes. Um, here's another. Um, now, for many of us, uh, at the front page of a newspaper like this uh, um, is, of course, a classic example of a multimodal text where we have all sorts of um, texts here coming together. I mean, the most obvious, of course, is that we have uh, written text here and we have uh, pictures, uh, visual images. So we have multiple modes interacting to support one another and to amplify particular kinds of messages. And so um, we might then also think about the way in which a text like this invites us um, to engage with it. Of course, uh, in a text like this, the images tend to draw our attention initially or the masthead. Um, and as we read, um, the columns provide some structuring for, um, for our reading and uh, allow us to navigate through this text in a way that um, uh, is a learned reading style. Uh, a text like this um, given to someone who's unfamiliar with front pages of newspapers uh, would be probably a difficult uh, negotiation exercise, but it would be one that would be possible um, because the modes that are being employed here provide some clues to how this text is to be read and engaged with. Um, not completely, um, but uh, some. So again, another, another brief example, the online newspaper. Uh, a screenshot from BuzzFeed, many of you will be familiar with. This is a, 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 an older BuzzFeed front page. Looks a bit different these days. Um, but again, it's just an example of the way in which um, particular kinds of texts like newspapers um, will employ uh, different modes over time as they engage new audiences, as they seek to engage um, readers in different kinds of reading experiences. Um, so, of course, um, the linear or the, the sort of horizontal columns of the New York Times are replaced by um, other kinds of structural features here. And so here we have, uh, again, an example of uh, an interesting and and more contemporary multimodal text in a newspaper format that um, requires us to think differently, I think, about the way in which we might engage with these sorts of text and help young people to, to navigate or understand them. Uh, here's, a, here's a quick example of, um, of a different kind of mode. Um, maybe you'll be familiar with the LTV building if you've been on uh, Clayton campus recently. It, it's, a, I think, an interesting example of the way architecture um, and space can communicate um, meaning. It certainly um, engages in a particular kind of uh, um, architecture and um, employs, I think, particular kinds of uh, materials that uh, are suggestive of particular kinds of experiences, um, uses um, and meanings. It can be useful as another example of, of multimodal meaning making but to also think about the built environment around us and the way that, that um, structures particular kinds of um, interactions and, uh, and meanings. How do you like working in the LTV, Flo? I'm getting used to it. <laughs> I actually found it interesting. Someone described it to me as a cathedral for learning. So right. they were making, and I understood exactly what they meant. They were making a link between the sort of for those of you who have visited it, the vertiginous sorts of spaces where there's, you can see all the way up through the whole core of the building into the ceiling with the light coming through those angled windows. Um, and I, I, had, I found that that was an interesting comparison. There is a sort of communication going on around 
wanting to elevate people or make people feel good about about being in that space i think that you could make a connection between that and earlier civic buildings for you know like the local church it's yeah indeed and of course whether or not those um affordances uh, are taken up by the people who use a space like this or whether we as users of different texts like a building like this um uh, have uh, resistant ways of using them or um, prefer to employ the, the particular kinds of resources not available to us in different ways those of course are uh, worth thinking about as well um, of course the architects would have designed this building with things in mind but um, people have a habit of taking up those resources in ways that uh, are often different than the intended uses that they were designed for just another couple of quick examples. Here's a manga called Nausicaa. The interesting thing here, I think, that we want to point out is that um, if you try and read this text in the way that a, a reader in a Western school system might have been educated to read in, you'll have difficulty. Um, the text is not read in that way because uh, this text is uh, it was originally written in Japanese and, and published in that country, the text is actually read um, in, a, in a quite a different way. In fact, instead of reading from uh, the top left-hand corner um, up here, well, let me use something else here. What can I do? Instead of beginning our reading from this point here and uh, moving down towards um, the other side of the text, uh, here, we in fact read in the other way. We read from this point here to here, um, this way here, around this way. Here, here, and here. Again, I mean, we've made this point, I, I guess, initially, that um, that modes are culturally specific. And here we have a, a good example of that, where um, the visual here, the, uh, the written language is employed um, in a, a different way to realise meanings uh, in this particular text and so our, our typical reading path uh, the conventions that we've become used to as uh, readers who perhaps have been educated in a, uh, a western education system are in fact not going to help us here and so we need to be attuned to the way in which um, modes can be used in culturally specific ways to, to realize different sorts of meanings um, now, just our final example, um, it comes from uh, a more contemporary text. Um, now, I'm going to play this um, for you first. No. <laughs> okay, so what might we make of such a text? Um, I asked my daughter um, to describe this text um for um, us all last night and here's what she's written um so I'll, I'll give you a chance to read that this is um her writing so charlie d'amelio um and her 40.3 million followers um are engaging in uh, uh interesting um, a set of interesting practices around these sorts of text. And of course, we're talking about uh, reasonably, um, well, well, we're certainly talking about multimodal text and, and we might be um, forgiven for thinking that this is a reasonably simple text, a, a everyday uh, text that might be sort of throwaway. Um, multimodal texts like this are of course becoming quite uh, common uh, amongst the, the students. And in fact, uh, ourselves, many of you will have uh, TikTok installed on your phone and maybe regular um, producers of TikTok videos and sharers of uh, these sorts of texts. 
Uh, and so we might um, think about what sort of modes are being engaged here, um, the way in which they're being engaged, the sorts of meanings that are being made um, by producers of these videos, but also viewers of these videos, and the kinds of communities, the kinds of uh, conventions, the kinds of culturally uh, specific ways in which the, the modes that are being employed here are being used to realise particular kinds of meanings. Um, I don't think, you know, given time, I want to say too much more about this, unless, Flo, you had, you had something you wanted to say here. I think there's a thesis waiting to be written on doing gender on t on TikTok. Uh, so yeah, if anyone's interested in doing a a, a, um, a master's a PhD thesis on on this sort of um, text and young people's use of them in education, then come and talk to us. Um, thanks, Lucy, for your explanation. As we've indicated, uh, modes are shaped through their use, and that use, of course, is cultural, historical, and, and social. And because of that, modes have uh, are used to realise particular kinds of social functions, um, like the ones we've been talking about. Um, we've talked about the fact that not all modes are equal, that they're used differently, and they're valued differently in different sorts of social and cultural situations. Um, and of course, modes shape the meanings that are able to be made in particular contexts with particular texts. And uh, those modes, 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 those meanings, sorry, are different. <coughs> Um, we realised in and through different modes. So we might now move to uh, focusing more on schools and, and thinking about how multimodality has something to offer us as um, people who are thinking about communication and meaning making in schools. And these are the sorts of questions we'd be keen um, to encourage you to think about. Um, for example, what, what kinds of texts are commonly found in schools? Um, and as a thought exercise, you might think of uh, a subject area in schools um, and the kinds of reading and writing activities that typically are done in that subject. So you might think of English, of course, um, and to consider the sorts of reading and writing practices that are typically done across um, a school day or a school week. Um, you might compare those sorts of texts that are commonly found in schools with the sorts of texts that young people engage with outside of schools. So we might begin to think about the differences between the sorts of texts commonly found in schools and those um, that young people might use outside of school. Of course, there's going to be some overlap um, and there's going to be um, lots of commonalities, but there's also, also going to be some differences and those differences might give us some reasons to think more carefully about the kinds of textual experiences that young people um, might be having in our own English classes. Um, Here's one possible way of thinking about a student's trajectory through subject English in a high school. Um, in year seven, eight, nine and 10, but it's not uncommon, I think, for young people in high schools to, to have this sort of textual diet, if you like, or that this is the sort of limits of their engagement, text response essays, persuasive writing, uh, argument analysis, um, or creative writing, generally, those would probably be the main textual diet that, that students would come up against. And maybe you're asking yourself, well, um, what's the problem with that? Um, and I think that's a reasonable question to ask. Um, and we might not uh, automatically want to uh, see this as a problem, but certainly it might give us pause for thought about the way in which um, schools might engage with or um, contemplate this question of um, how are meanings made in our lives um, beyond school and how might school and particularly English culture just take account of those uh, different forms of meaning making and textuality that um, are very common and in fact uh, um, you might argue in fact that, that uh, forms of meaning making beyond the forms that are on the slide here are much more common in people's lives but that at school, um, we're asked often to engage in, in, in a very select range of textual practices. So another way to make that argument really is made here by Albers. Um, she argues that modes of communication, such as visual, speech, writing, gesture, um, music, and so on, enable humans to interpret and represent meaning. And meaning is not located within any one mode, but in how the modes are interpreted in relation to one another. 
So Elvis is asking us, I think, prompting us to think about the responsibility that English teachers might have for thinking about those other modes and how young people can be helped to make um, and create meanings in those other modes. If we're focusing on a particular set of modes only, then we might ask ourselves whether um, that's an appropriate response for English teachers in a contemporary society where meanings are in fact made through all sorts of modes. Um, the image in the middle is um, an image of students' work um, produced uh, in response to an English task in, in an English classroom um, by a colleague of ours. Um, some of you might be familiar with the image on the left um, from Sean Tan's uh, story and short film, The Lost Thing. Um, and uh, David Metzenton's uh, text, One Minute Silence. So these are examples of multimodal texts that um, are popping up in English classrooms these days and um, provide for um, some additional opportunities for meaning making. Flo, did you want to sort of address any of these texts in, in particular or make any comment here? Um, only that it's hard to see, but the image in the middle, there's actually, the bottle is in paper mache, so it was actually three-dimensional. It was a three-dimensional multimodal text that that student made, but the task was to write a poem, I think, about an issue in, the, in your community or in your life, and this student chose to present the poem in this way. Um, and clearly, by adding the images of the people at the bottom, and I think um, the bottle's holding up a, a figure in the grasp of the bottle, it adds something to the poem that the poem on its own perhaps wouldn't achieve quite so powerfully. So yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting example of multimodality and assessment, which we're going to talk about. Okay, so in, in, oh, in terms of sort of focusing directly on English teaching a little more, um, we might sort of provide a bit of a summary here. So um, as we've argued, that print literacies tend to still dominate schools. And, and that's what we've tried to indicate here. Um, there is some recognition and a growing recognition, at least over the last 10 to 15 years, um, that a multimodal ways of uh, making meanings and engaging with texts are important. And those, are, those understandings have begun to emerge in, um, in curriculum in Victoria and Australia and internationally. Um, so if uh, you've had a chance to, to browse the Australian curriculum yet or the Victorian curriculum, you will um, have seen or will see that that curriculum specifically asks teachers and students to engage with multimodal texts in the classroom and to think about their creation, um, their uh, use, and uh, in, all, in all sorts of different ways um, that, that just wouldn't have been a feature of curriculum, say uh, 15 to 20 years ago. So um, we might um, begin then to think as English teachers um, around th these sorts of issues and how we might engage with the imperatives and the, and the encouragements of curriculum documents um, and the sorts of texts our students are engaging with and how we might bring those two together in, uh, in meaningful ways in the curriculum. Um, that uh, multimodal texts um, can be the focus for legitimate and complex meaning making, um, inquiry and design projects. It can really stretch young people to do things that, uh, that are meaningful and authentic. And of course, uh, not just creative, but also have analytic possibilities and um, we'll be showing you a couple of ways in which that might be possible um, with some examples. I'll hand over to you Flo. All right thanks Scott. So the first example of us, two of us are going to talk about an example of using multimodal texts in the English classroom. The first example is a documentary film called Wasteland and I taught this film for a year eight class and it was a class with a very wide range of abilities and interests and learning styles. And so I was having to think very carefully about how I engaged them with this text. And also they really put me on the spot in terms of their diversity to think about, and to think creatively about how I was going to ask them to show some understanding of the text and to engage with its ideas. 
So Wasteland's a documentary um, about an artist called Vic Muniz, who's originally from Brazil. He now works in Brooklyn, in near, near New York. And he goes back to Brazil. He goes to a large waste ground or, or dump called, um, I think it's called Garden Dramatro. Um, and he engages with the cutadors, the pickers who work in this, in this enormous dump ground and they pick through the rubbish for recyclable materials to sell on and they live in more or less in slums um, called favelas that ring the, the, this wasteland. So it's about them and the work he does with them. And this was a, an exciting opportunity to teach documentary as a form but also to have the students engage with the meaning making of this documentary in a variety of ways. To give you a sense of this, there's text there about um, what they do. And they, they work with the rubbish, with the garbage to make art together. So this is the preview. What I really want to do is to be able to change the lives of a group of people with the same material that they deal with every day. Muito bom. Pensando assim, o que você vai fazer na hora que você sair daqui do Jardim Gramado? <risos> Thank you. So I, I showed this as part of a, a, a ostensibly a film study unit in, in year eight, but I wanted them to, I wanted the students to engage with the multimodality of the film in a variety of ways and to show understanding of the film. So we, we watched the film together and we, I wanted them to particularly look at the artwork and the fact that the artwork itself was multimodal. So this, this is an example of the artwork. So they took a photograph of the cutter doors. And for those of you who are art buffs, buffs you can see that there's particular um, artwork being referenced there. And they would project the photograph onto the floor as a plate. And then the cutter doors created through the garbage uh, a picture or they filled in the picture with, with recyclable materials in various ways. And then they took a shot of that. So I wanted the students to be thinking about the process of this artwork and to engage in the lives of the cutter doors in a way that gave them an insight that was embodied in some way. So I was thinking about the multimodality of embodiment as well as the multimodality of the text itself. So you can see here on, on the screen an image of a collage with some post-it notes on it. So what I asked the students to do is I put them into groups, I put them into mixed ability groups. I was also, um, I had some pastoral and social cohesiveness goals around this unit. It was early in the year and I wanted the students to have some experience of working outside of their friendship groups and to create some more cohesiveness in, in the class as a whole. So I put them into groups of mixed ability groups and asked them to bring in recyclable materials to a, to a lesson in the morning. And we created a big pile of recycled materials. I also brought some in 
And in groups, their task was to design a poster that in some way represented an idea that they saw in, in the film and that represented their response to that idea in the film. And so they had a couple of lessons. There was paper all over the floor. There was glue. There was tissue paper. There were girls crouched on the floor. And they made these posters. And then the post-it notes, and if you can click again, Scott, there's another example here. The post-it notes were their written explanations of their design and, what, and how their design related to the ideas in the film. And it's interesting that um, all of them related to the relationships in the film and, the, and related to the bridging across boundaries, the idea that across people's boundaries of their lives, the things that separated them, that they might reach out and connect with each other. And this came through very strongly in the collages that they made. They then presented their collage to the class and gave a verbal explanation of, of the text. So this is an example here of asking students to not only watch a multimodal text, but construct multimodal texts in response to it to show their understanding. And that multimodality does, does not necessarily mean digital. We tend to think about it in terms of the digital, but it could be something as low tech as collage and written post-it notes. That's still engaging with a range of modes. And the students responded very positively to this task. And it certainly aided in the social cohesive cohesiveness of the group as well. Um, Scott, if you could scroll through to the next one. I then asked them to engage with the artwork that was being alluded to in throughout the painting. So I'm just going to quickly go through these. So um, we looked at the Galenas by Jean-Francois Millet. Each group was chose a painting that referred to the image and they went and researched that painting and found out about what the meaning of that painting was and then how that might relate to the meaning of the artwork that was made by Vic Meniz and the Cutadors. And so they were able to relate this visual text to its background. So um, this is Zumbi uh, on the left. He collected books for the Cutadors to read if he found books in the garbage and made a collective library. And he's represented as the sower. So he's sowing the seeds of learning in amongst his people and so that was one of the meanings that the students unearthed by engaging with that text and lastly I think there's one or two more so this woman on the left she was having a very difficult period in her life and she's re represented with an allusion to Picasso's blue period painting which students then found out was a period um, of introspection for Picasso and so this this allowed us to talk about the artwork as carrying some kinds of meaning and symbolism. Again, this is a multimodal engagement with the text. And lastly, the students were, um, did an oral, which I gave them the option of uh, doing a short film themselves. And many students took up that opportunity and made short films. I had short films on recycling, and one group did short films on portraiture, the history of portraiture. So there was also opportunities for a negotiated curriculum. Students chose their own topic um, as long as it was linked to the film in some way. And that was a unit that I, I still um, regard as one of the most enjoyable I taught. And we used multimodality in a layered way. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Lou. That, it's uh, fascinating. We wanted to indicate some of the range of ways in which multimodality might be taken up, not just in presenting young people with multimodal texts, but also in asking them to become creators and designers of their own texts. And to use um, this idea of multimodality in a way that activates their work in English classrooms and um, allows them to become um, uh, more familiar and um, more expert in the um, use of particular modes that perhaps are less emphasised and valued in schools, or certainly have been in the past, um, but that ironically, of course, are often highly valued um, beyond schools. So the example for uh, it comes to mind is the, the TikTok example from earlier. Young people creating texts like that, or their own graphic novels, their own YouTube videos, uh, are engaging in um, work with uh, different sorts of modes that often don't get exercised very much in their classroom work in in English in in secondary schools. We think that's a shame. We think that 
is potentially a, a blind spot or a problem um, for thinking about um, inclusive classrooms um, that are open to the needs of diverse learners. And beyond that, um, prepare young people for the sorts of environments, the sorts of meaning making, multimodal and semiotic environments that they're confronting um, on a day to day, uh, in the day to day, not just in the future, but also now. Um, so there are lots of opportunities and so many interesting resources out there for doing this kind of work in classrooms that that we really feel positive and hopeful about the opportunities that English teachers have um, to engage with these sorts of ideas in their work. And so we'd be encouraging you, of course, to think really seriously about the kinds of work that uh, is, is typically going on in the classrooms that you get to see and experience into teaching and to push yourself to think about how might it be otherwise and how might you engage with the wealth of resources that are available to you to um, explore the, the meaning making potential of different kinds of texts and modes. Sort of wrap up with the final slide, just some, um, some so what implications. Um, Flo, is there any of these that you wanted to touch? Sure. I, I, I really think that, I mean, we've, I think we've covered most of these points, but this is just to reiterate. There is an idea of literacy out there that mistakes school literacy as the only legitimate form of literacy. But when we think about literacy practices in people's lives and the way in which they move in and out of using text in various ways, literacy is a repertoire of of media, strategies, relationships, formats that people are engaging with in different ways according for, to different situations and purposes. And so we might think about how that fluidity, that idea of literacy as a repertoire of, of strategies and, and media might be used in our classrooms to open up um, our classrooms to other forms of literacy that also mean that students might be more likely to engage in some of the more formal literacies that we also want them to engage with. So I, I don't want anyone to mistake our message to be don't teach text response essays, but that's not what we're saying. But we are saying that thinking about literacy as a landscape of practices that people are engaging with over the course of their days gives us more range in, in what we're recruiting as we teach our students. I think on that note, we might, um, we might finish. <laughs>